Could you get the light? Thank you very much, Cathy. As a, appropriate for a talk on autobiography, that was partly true. <laughs> I warn you, this is a rather long paper, so I hope you haven't got anything else booked for the next hour or so. But you will, during this time, get to hear several other voices other than my own, so it's not just me droning on. <clears throat> Last month, I met my grandfather, who died nearly a century ago. My son, researching our family tree, found this picture in the archives of a local newspaper. Herbert Snell was killed in action in France, less than a year after his brother was killed at the Somme. His sudden appearance on my laptop last month was quite a moment. History, memories, families, real and imagined pasts. It chimed with what I've been reading this winter, various kinds of autobiographical writing in Hindi, some actual autobiographies, but also memoirs, and many kinds of briefer sketches some literary, some commonplace, all deeply human. I only began this project in November, so it's still what technical Hindi would call take off stage wala. I'm not, I'm not reaching for some overarching theory so much as learning from the manifestations of lives lived and feelings felt and of observing how the various authors achieve their goals or sometimes exceed them, saying more between the lines than was intended. My interest is in the texts themselves and in their poetics, poetics viewed as a delivery system for emotion and experience. With the help of friends and colleagues, we'll hear some extracts that I've translated into English for this talk. Autobiography. This six-syllabled monster appears in some form or other in most European languages, except these Scandinavian ones, which prefer versions of a Germanic self to the Greek auto. In fact, use of self-biography predates autobiography in English, but failed to take off, rather as Swarjivani did in Hindi. There's a nice linguistic parallel here. Self-biography and Swarjivani are cognate, not only here in the prefix self and swa, but also here in the living heart of the word with bio and jiva. A nice reminder of Indo-European connectivity of shared etymological grandparents. In Hindi, we have the formal word atmakatha, narration of self, a Sanskritic word, but not very useful, perhaps in real Sanskrit, as the autobiographical genre or gene did not feature in ancient India. Something as intimate as autobiography deserves a vernacular name also. And Hindi's second term is the nicely articulate ap biti, roughly what befell one. It, it hints at things endured rather than things achieved, meshing nicely with the very grammar of Hindi in which things happen to people as much as they are done by them, the expression of agency differing strongly from equivalence in English. Then there is sansmaran, memoir, perhaps not clearly distinguished as a separate genre. The reflexive concept of autobiography is a little blurry in some quarters. For example, the Amazon website offers the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin by Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> in, in fact, the line separating biography from autobiography really can be very thin. Even when writers describe others, a strong portrayal of self emerges willy-nilly in their words. In everything we write, we display a great deal about our own selves. The style of autobiographical titles literal or playful or elusive, can hint at what lies within. The, the title of satirist Gopal Prasad Vyas's feisty and episodic autobiography has a reflexive spin. Kaho Vyas, kesi kati? Something like, well Vyas, how did it go? A self-question which is answered in nearly 700 intense pages of narrative fireworks. <laughs> Novelist Manu Bhandari plays with, genre, plays with genre categories in her title, uh, Ek Kahani Yebhi, This Too, A Story, as she charts the decline of her marriage to another novelist, Rajendra Yadav. As an example of a very plain style, Shivrani Premchand's memoir of her husband, the so-called father of the Hindi novel, is called Premchand Gharme. It means Premchand at home, and it's about well, Premchand at home. Of course, a plain style is a style in its own right. 
like Swabhavokti in Poetics. And Shivrani's book is not without sophistication of its own. She recalls many a quarrel between husband and wife in another interface between autobiography and fiction. These sweet squabbles are surely the model for the, uh, for the Hori Dhania relationship in Prem Chand's 1936 novel, Godan. The wives, real and fictional, chide and prod and nudge, but neither ever erodes the high status that is a husband's due in their shared world. And convention demands that he is never referred to directly by name. Something of a constraint, one might think, in, auto in biographical writing. Some titles evoke genres from elsewhere. Among the many opposition leaders locked up by Indira Gandhi in her state of emergency in 1975 to 77 was the redoubtable Chandrasekhar, who was to serve briefly as prime minister in 1991. His jail diary is called simply Meri Jail Diary, a phrase that claims kinship with a broad genre of works written from unjust imprisonment. Is that martyrdom I sniff in the air? Surely not. Chandrasekhar's surprisingly readable book is written in a robust and expressive Hindi, drawing on its full lexicon and range of registers, if influenced by English rhetoric and idiom. As with so many Hindi autobiographers, the leitmotif of the Ramayana runs through his work. And when I discussed the book with him one afternoon in 1995, quotations from Tulsidas peppered his conversation. So here's an extract. Irritated by a dawn search of his cell during his imprisonment in Patiala jail, Chandrasekhar used his political connections to complain to the higher authorities. When the Home Minister failed to reply to my letters, it became clear that Delhi had deliberately resolved to keep me in solitary confinement. I was furious at being roused in the early morning for a search. At some point, one has to stand up to things regardless of consequences. I called the jail superintendent and told him I wanted to bring the matter to the attention of Chief Minister and his senior officials. The superintendent was a decent fellow. He was grieved by what I said and told me he was ashamed of what had happened. I was very angry, but in view of his conciliatory words and manner, I said that he should consider the matter was closed, but that the vile jailer should be spoken to. Well, the incident was over. This typifies the, memoir, the memoirs of political leaders with a literalness of narration. This happened, that happened, I said, he said, and so on, and few flourishes. But this long book is also unwittingly a window on self-righteous power, or the frustration of such power denied. Perhaps no memoir in English could portray the mindset or selfhood of an Indian neta so closely. Autobiographers may seem to control the extent of their narrative revelations, but the, matter of, the manner of their writing reveals more than they intend. The act of autobiography can be a hostage to fortune. Jail. I never intended to go there, but so many of these narratives evoke it that I have no choice. Two or three years before Chandrasekhar enjoyed his mild inconveniences behind bars in Patiala, a very different kind of drama was played out in Miawali across the border some 600 kilometers to the northwest. Mohanlal Bhaskar, inspired by a strong sense of national duty, had become a spy for his country. Duly circumcised, circumcised he went on a secret mission to Pakistan. He was caught, arrested, tried, imprisoned, and convicted to 14 years imprisonment. He greeted the announcement of his sentence with elation. It was better than hanging, after all, and he equated it to Rama's 14-year exile from Ayodhya. But the grisly memoir of his torture in jail contains many accounts too horrifying to present here. Bhaskar's inconveniences contained, uh, behind bars were rather more extreme than Chandrasekhar's. They included being suspended from the ceiling by the wrists and beaten unconscious with a variety of weaponry. In less suspenseful moments, he described more ironic aspects of prison life. Eventually, thank God, we Indian prisoners were transferred from Multan jail, a really foul place, back to Mianwali. But the bad apples of other jails were turning this one rotten too. Bird fighting with partridges or quails was rife, sodomy no less so. The prisoners gambled and provoked the jailers. Knives would appear suddenly over nothing at all. The Don, a dacoit called Ghulam Hassan, kept a harem of twelve boys to sleep with him in turn. Whenever some sweet-faced lad arrived in the jail, the mobsters would be waiting inside the gate, blades at the ready, vying with each other to bed him first. 
These young newcomers are mostly loafers, pickpockets, small-time thieves, and pimps. They hadn't been such model citizens in the outside world that they would object to a little rough business inside, and in fact, they were happy at the prospect of an easy life behind bars, with delicacies like chicken, mutton, and vegetable curries to enjoy, not to mention fine soaps, oils, and perfumes for bathing. The inmate aristocracy dressed them to the nines and kept them like wives. They were known as the jail fairies. <laughs> the next paragraph is not designed for a nice afternoon in the Myerson, so my English rendering stops right there. And the theme of lust in translation waits for another day. <laughs> Pasco was eventually repatriated to India through the Wagha checkpoint on 9th of December 1974. Among the people who had helped him bring about his release was one Harivan Shrai Bachchan, whom we'll meet soon enough. Meanwhile, let's bask for a moment in the, gl the glow of childhood memories from Krishan Chandar, the Hindi and Urdu fiction and screenplay writer. His autobiography is called Aadhe Safar Ki Puri Kahani, the full story of a half-made journey. Ratios that were ironically inverted when Chandar's life ended before the book was completed. A gentle humor runs through his well-crafted tales of school days, and here's a typical example. Krishan Chandra's father was the school doctor, and his classmate, Abdullah, was related to the headmaster. The teachers, the teachers were reluctant to beat such well-connected pupils, and this immunity from punishment threatened the boy's image as the school tough guys. So they plotted like this. We planned that when Master G asked a question in the geography class next day, we would give a completely wrong answer. This would get us a beating from Master G and the enthusiastic approval of our classmates. Next day, Master G showed us a map of Africa and asked, Where is Kenya? I raised my hand and said, Sir, he's off school today. His mother is unwell. The whole class fell about laughing. Master G was furious, but he swallowed his anger. Then Abdullah raised his hand. Krishan's wrong, sir. It is a species of donkey. It is found in the jungles of Africa. <laughs> the anecdote is simple enough, but notice Krishan Chandra's skillful manipulation of register in that closing sentence, which survives translation unscathed. Africa ke jangalon mein paya jata hai. It is found in the jungles of Africa. Its passive voice and formal tone captures the documentary register of a school textbook dressing Abdullah's answer in sober authenticity. Janda shows a distinctly writerly skill here, something much more knowing and deliberate than the style found in Chandrasekhar's memoir. Why are words such as childish, infantile, puerile, and juvenile all derogatory? A perspective free of adult cynicism gives us a rich view of the world and our place in it, and the magic of childhood makes this genre of autobiography a treasure trove of wonders. Krishan Chandra's chapter on his boyhood ends with the words, I am still that child, I haven't changed at all. And it's a perception that colors many of these re uh, revealed lives. Another example comes in the sketchbook of memories assembled by the artist Makbul Fida Hussain. He, he narrates his life, Apni Zubani, in his own words, but uses the third person, referring to his childhood persona as Makbul or the boy and describing detail in a homely register well matched to the scenes being portrayed. Acquaintance with the boy's family members, their names, relationships, appearance and temperament will give you some indication of the atmosphere in which he grew up and was raised. But that's no good. What happened to the homely register I mentioned? My translation's far too Latinate and stilted. Let me try again. Meet the boys' aunts and uncles and siblings and grandparents. See their looks and moods, and you'll get a sense of how it felt growing up in that family. As time went on, the scale and spread of the world made its mark on him, spelling out the way things would be. He took himself outside the four walls of the house, and his understanding of the world did not come from the rules of geometry. Grandfather Abdul Hussein, son of Ibrahim, a small shop in Pandarpur selling and repairing oil lamps, lanterns and the like, a brown tight-fitting Achkan coat, white beard, black hat on his head, father, Fida Hussein, a timekeeper in Karim Pai Ibrahim's indoor Malwa textile mill, 
Coat and trousers topped off with a jaunty red Turkish cap, a dark beard like George V's, proudly curled mustache. His first wife, Zanab, passed away when the boy was born. That boy will be seen skipping and playing through the pages of this book, sometimes laughing, sometimes crying, drowning in colors and smells, a worshiper of beauty and always prey to romance. Hussein's third-person conceit works well, but his tone doesn't survive in my two English English. Hussein once asked me to translate the book, but I had the good sense not to take it on. My instincts for the Persianate idiom are too weak, and his voice eludes me. I've discovered that half the trick in translating is to choose texts that fit one's own temperament and that can be worn comfortably like a borrowed coat. Otherwise, one has to be both translator and actor. Too tough a call. The original is always sacrosanct, always a thing of its own. Translation problems of a different kind arise in a narrative from scholar and novelist Hazari Prasad Dwivedi. Hazari Prasad, the name, half Persianate, half Sanskritic, represents in miniature a cultural symbiosis that runs through so many of these memoirs. But attitudes vary. Dwivedi's own guru once told him, your name has a whiff of Muslimness about it. To which Dwivedi replied, Guruji, call it a fragrance. Tere naam mein musulmaniyat ki boo hai. Guruji, sugand kahiye. If only all xenophobia could be so wittily disarmed. Anyway, Dwivedi was one of many post-independence writers to be included in Nehru's cultural delegations to Russia, marking the close ties between the USSR and India in those years of friendship and cooperation. Armed with only Hindi and English, and clearly no Russian, Dwivedi had difficulty knowing how much to pay for his tea in the hotel in Moscow. But he finally resolved the matter in dumb show. And then... An elderly gentleman standing nearby was observing all this. He quickly saw that I spoke no Russian. He asked me something very warmly. What he actually said, I had no idea. But clearly he was asking where I was from. India, I said. He leapt up. India, Nehru, India, Nehru. His pleasure was a sight to be seen. His joyful face and his eyes brimming with tears of happiness spoke in a way that was beyond the power of the most richly developed language. From then on, whenever we met, on our way about town, on the street, on the hotel veranda, he would raise his hat and cry out elatedly, India, Nehru. And I would reply, India, Nehru. It became our salutation and our reply. It was both dialogue and benediction for us. We became good friends, and everything that needed to be said was said by these two words alone. This encounter truly marks a particular moment in the history of the world, but it's a literary moment as well as a linguistic one, hence the translation problem. Dwivedi's Hindi is relaxedly Sanskritic, formal, if you like to use such a word, for a high register and yet natural and unstrained written style. Dwivediji may speak of such things as Anandasrupur Netra and of Sambhashan, but this is the fragrance of educated diction, not the whiff of neologism, still less the rank odor of pedantry. There are few, if any, calques or neologisms in the elegant, elegant original of this passage. A better translation than mine would capture its stylistic poise more fully, because register is the heart of the message. Dwivedi is the cultivated visitor abroad, a cultural ambassador, our man in Soviet Moscow. His reference to a language's state of development reflects a concern about the ability of Hindi to perform in the new arenas that it had been asked to occupy after independence. If his own articulacy was anything to go by, he need not have worried. Auto autobiographically speaking, I met Dwivedi Ji just once, one April evening in 1977, at his house on the BHU campus in Benares. We talked in almost total darkness during a power cut, Refusing a servant's offer of candles, he gave me illuminating advice on my nascent PhD research through the gloom. His Hindi astounded and confounded me. I did my best to hold up my end of the conversation, but in retrospect, I'd have done better if I'd limited my sambhashan to 
India, Nehru, India, <laughs> Nehru. <laughs> of the several autobiographers I have both read and met, the only one I came to know well was Harivans Rai Bachchan, whose four-volume Hindi memoirs I translated into a single condensed volume of, in English, and with whom I sat for long hours at the family house in Juhu, discussing my, program, my progress through his life. The title of his first volume, Kya Bhulun, Kya Yad Karun, What Should I Forget, What Should I Remember, raised the crucial question of what I should keep and what I should cut as I edited his books. My technique was to summarize each of the 1,400-odd Hindi pages in a single sentence, making signposts for a coherent narrative. Bachchan's first volume caused quite a stir on its publication in 1969. Professor Namvar Singh says it contained the first, ho uh, the first confession of homosexual love in the whole of Hindi literature. But I shan't pursue Bachchan's roaming heart here, being too much beholden to the Bachchan family. His later three volumes don't quite live up to the first, but they appeal to many because they record incidents in the life of his iconic son, Amitab, the Ishta Devta of Bollywood. Part four has the elusive title, Dastwar Se Sopantak, its apparent meaning being from 10 doors to the stairway. Dastwar, 10 doors, is in fact a symbolic allusion to the 10 portals of the human body. I'll leave you to do the math and to contemplate ingress and egress. But Dastwar and Sopan are actually the names of houses where Bachchan lived in Allahabad and Delhi, respectively. In this extract, Dr. Bachchan visits his son in hospital after an accident on the set of Manmohan Desai's 1982 film, Kuli, an accident that only boosted Amitabh's fame while the country held its breath awaiting his recovery. Amitabh was on the danger list. His whole body was covered in a sheet, only his face showing, pale, dull, his eyes reflecting the pain and anguish he had endured. When he saw, saw me, he managed a faint smile and then closed his eyes again. I put my hand on his head. Then I came away, slowly, heavy at heart, my mind avoid. A grievous situation, a most unfortunate situation, a heart-rending situation but not a new one. To see someone in pain, someone so much one's own, the life of one's life, lying there wounded, deeply ill, and not to be able to help them. It was a foretaste of death that I had known many times. Bachchan's style here is again very writerly, heavy with portent, thick with parallelisms, dramatic with stark juxta juxtapositions a grievous situation, a most unfortunate situation, a heart-rending situation, but not a new one. The jump from a formal to a vernacular register and from polysyllables to short, pithy words achieves an efficient bathos. Bachchan alludes to earlier moments of grief and suffering, such as the death of his first wife and of his father. Like many authors, he reaches up for a Sanskritic lexicon to intensify mood. But Bachchan's Sanskritic register is quite different from Dvivedi's. Unlike Dvivedi's organically mature Hindi, Bachchan's language includes many calques and other symptoms of the English literature background, which included writing a doctorate on W.B. Yeats from Christ College, Cambridge, during which he visited Yeats's widow in Ireland. What I have translated as a heart-rending situation is in the Hindi, Hride Vidarak Stiti which is simply the English phrase calced into Hindi. So the phrase is already a translation, or an example of thinking in English, writing in Hindi, to use Harish Trivedi's telling phrase. Bachchan is not Dvivedi. But that being said, Hindi is the richer for having both of them. By definition, autobiographies written in the second half of the 20th century often hark back to the first half, and hence to its defining theme, the independence movement that led to the partition of India in 1947. Academic an analysis of writing from this era often focuses on the development of a nationalist consciousness, productively, if dutifully, following the imagined communities model so crisply imagined by Benedict Anderson. Anderson's term imagined seems to bear derogatory intent, bent upon revealing nationhood to be a mere artificial construct. But the broad sweep of cultural theory is done at the cost of individuality, 
Hence my ambition to amplify the voices of Hindi's autobiographers. Hindi autobiographies are an important source for, and perhaps even corrective of, any broad sweep depiction of national history, but they're largely ignored in academia. In this intertextual genre, we see a mesh of connections between writers, their works, their relationships, and the dynamics of their literary world. Buy one, get one free. One author describes another, and we meet both. The trope, young writer has a first encounter with mentor-to-be, occurs various times. Meet Jainendra Kumar, as he journeys to Lucknow to meet his literary hero, Munshi Premchand. The title Munshi is an honorific for a professional penman. Premchand's directions to a red house in Amin Dola Park proved rather too vague, as Jenendra tells us. By five o'clock or so, I found myself in Amin Dola Park. I rested my luggage on the deserted benches of a stall at the roadside. One or two distinguished-looking gentlemen were strolling about, and I asked almost each of them, Excuse me, can you direct me to Premchand's house? It's around here somewhere. Yes, Premchand. A humble expression, some mental cogitation, a little head-scratching, and... Premchand? Who would this Premchand be? The celebrated man of letters, the novelist, and editor. Come, sir, he's a very well-known man. Premchand, said one, perplexed, apologizing for his ignorance. Begging my pardon, taking his leave, picking up his cane, he left me and continued on his walk. Six o'clock found me still there by the road, as did half-past six. By this time I had pardoned several dozen such individuals, each of whom I had made the target of my inquiries. Each one had professed himself unable to help me. Finally, I asked some fellow of more modest appearance, My friend, can you tell me where Premchand's house is? Munshi Premchand, he asked. The concept of Munshidam in respect of Premchand was unfamiliar to me. I said, Well, yes, that must be him, I suppose. He's the one, all right, he said. He picked up my bags and without a word set them down in front of Premchand's house, just a little way off. Then he said, This is the place. Now give him a shout. I gave him a shout. My shout must have lacked the energy to climb two stories, cross a wall, and find its way into the house through the window. So the man hollered, Babuji! Babuji! After a moment, a voice called down from upstairs, Who is it? Me, Jenendra. Come on up. This too is very much the work of a novelist with its skillful weaving of the narrative thread, the selection of representative detail, the anticipation caused by hearing Premchand's voice finally, but without yet seeing him. These literary traits inject life into the anecdote. And then there's the subtext of Jen Endra's learning curve. He finds to his surprise that Premchand, the celebrated writer, is quite unknown to his middle-class neighbors. The writer's world, it seems, is not the whole of life after all. How fortunate that academia never suffers from such delusions. <laughs> but as I guide you round the monopoly board of this genre, we find ourselves going to jail again. During the independence movement, a spell in a British Raj prison was de rigueur for nationalist credentials. But what different routes actually led, led to the jail gate? To borrow a trope from Thatcherite politics, there were the wets and the dries, that is, the nominal supporters and the card-carrying diehards, and we'll see examples of both. Among the wets, for whom a spell in jail was little more than a rite of passage, we find Congress politician Chaudhry Ranbir Singh. His son Bhupinder Singh Hudda, incidentally, is currently Chief Minister of Haryana while his grandson, Vipender Singh Hudda, represents Rotak in the Lok Sabha. Watch this space for dynastic updates. <laughs> the good Chaudhary's autobiography is a serviceable, but rather worthy kind of narrative, with a tendency to giving bold lists of achievements, and with few aspirations to literary subtlety or, de or depth. And why should there be, after all? There are many ways to skin a cat, and many ways to tell a tale. Here he recounts his personal satyagraha, 
the Gandhian path of passive resist resistance that led to his imprisonment in 1939 to 1940. The decision to undertake Septyagraha was my own, made by my inner soul, with no influence from any other quarter. I had consulted nobody, sought no one's advice. After making my decision, I went to Father and told him about it in muted tones. A broad smile lit up his elderly face. His eyes sparkled as he slapped me on the back and said, I am overjoyed that my son has vowed to serve his country. May God give you the strength to work in service of the motherland and win, win renown for yourself and our family. I wasn't sure that even if I became a satyagrahi, I would be allowed to go to jail because Gandhiji had established an elaborate protocol. The first step was to seek permission through the local leadership. You had to stand in line for satyagraha just as you, had, just as you would wait for rations, and the whole thing had become quite competitive. Anyone wanting to do a personal satyagraha had to write to the deputy commissioner to inform him that on so and such a date and time and at so and such a place, he would shout slogans against the war. The police would then come and arrest the satyagrahi before the sloganeering began. And so it happened, a kind of ritual dance with equal degrees of bureaucratic process on both sides. Ranbir Singh courted arrest, was duly arrested, and was sentenced to a year's imprisonment, which he spent happily enough in Rohtak and Firozpur jails. The narrative is idealized and formulaic. Reported conversations are prosaic rather than conversational, being written in the s precisely the same style as the surrounding narrative prose, without any attempt at colloquial realism. The story is told with an airbrushed, romanticizing retrospection, and the grand theme of the author's contribution to the independence movement is never interrupted by creative flourishes or profound meditations. Simply sign up, line up, go to jail, and earn your freedom fighter spurs. Such narratives are commonplace, and many accounts of the years before 1947 fall into formulae like these, as in the par parallel genre of hagiography. These wets contrast strongly with the dries, for whom fighting for independence meant just that, a fight using guns and explosives rather than slogans and policies. Ram Prasad Bismil's intense Atmakatha is a damaging, grueling read that provides real background to the history of the period. As far as I know, it has never been translated into English. Ram Prasad became an early member of the Hindustan Republic Association, Repub a Republican Association, HRA, in his youth, and worked alongside several freedom fighters who happened to achieve much greater fame. Both Chandrasekhar Azad and Bhagat Singh, for example, became canonized as national heroes. It was their heroism that, that inspired Mohan Bhaskar to spy for India in Pakistan some decades later. Here are Azad and Singh, as portrayed in the canonical Amarchitra Katha comic series. Their lives and their martyrdoms are part of the national consciousness and are represented through many a graven or painted image. These icons become the cute, received version of history, with Azad's moustache twirling as familiar as Gandhi's spinning wheel or Nehru's red rose. Here is the face that launched a thousand lith lithographs. But the grim realities of the lives and deaths of these freedom fighters are less picturesque. Azad was eventually cornered in an Allahabad park, and the outcome recorded by the British was not very glamorous. Like this wounds and all photograph, autobiographies do not compromise in narrating detail, and they're a useful corrective to the romantic visions of popular culture. Ram Prasad Bismil's history as a freedom fighter got a recent boast, boost through the 2006 movie Rangde Basanti. Born in 1897, Ram Prasad was an ardent Arya Samaji. He took the pen name Bismil, a Persian word meaning the sacrificed. The national poem or song, Sir Farosi Ki Tamanna, is associated with him. Pen names are fanciful by nature, but Bismil's was prophetic, if not self-fulfilling. He's best known for his part in the HRA's looting of a train containing government re revenues at Kakuri, just outside Lucknow, on the 9th of August, 1925. Soon after this dr dramatic event, the key figures were arrested, tried, and sentenced to death. Bismil wrote his autobiography in Gorakhpur jail, awaiting execution. 
dead man writing. One might expect the book to rail against the British Raj, but more prominent themes are the lack of concord against the, uh, between the various regional factions of the freedom struggle, the general lack of unity, and the frustration of being duped by arms dealers and betrayed by supposed allies. Bismil, the sacrificed, the martyr, was eventually hanged on 18th of December 1927. His autobiography is remarkable for the strictness of the ascetic ideals he recommends to his readers, for the depictions of the almost banal background to momentous historical events, and of course for the meditations of a condemned man, but also for depictions of formative childhood experiences such as this. From my early childhood, father took a close interest in my education and would beat me thoroughly for the slightest error. I recall as if it were yesterday the difficulties I had in learning the vowel U in, in the Devanagari script. I truly did my best to master it, but as soon as my father went off to court, I would be up and off to play. When he came home and found me still unable to write that character, he knew I did play truant and he bet me so hard with a metal ramrod that it actually bent in his hand. My only escape was to run to my grandmother. Such beatings were frequent but had no effect on my mutinous nature. Perhaps it was those childhood beatings that made my body so hard and so resistant to pain. Perhaps so, and one could venture other kinds of connections between Ram Prasad the errant youth, beaten half to death by his own father with a ramrod, and Ram Prasad the revolutionary. Many other freedom fighters from this period were equally resolute dries. Not all were executed, several su survived their imprisonment to become well-established literary figures after independence. Yashpal, who was involved in an attempt to spring Bhagat Singh from Lahore jail in 1929 and who tried to blow up the Viceroy's train in the same year, was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment three years later. In jail, he married fellow conspirator Prakashwati, whom I was privileged to meet in Lucknow in the early 90s. Yashpal's three-volume autobiography, Singhavalokan, a title that might be translated as Looking Back, Moving Ahead, sits aside a large body of work that established him as one of Hindi's most successful post-independence writers. It presents the argument for an armed revolution, Sashastra Kranti, and an impassioned critique of Gandhian non-violence. Prakashvati's own memoir, memoir Lahore Se Lucknow Tak, supplies yet another perspective, amongst other things, vehemently contesting Bachchan's autobiographical account of, of his interactions with her. A friend and accomplice of the Yashpals, the writer Agye, was born a hundred years ago, a week next Monday. His memoirs tell us how childhood experiments with fireworks matured into bomb-making for the nationalist cause. Agye became a colossus in the world of Hindi letters, a poet whose poetry I hardly dare teach in class for fear of not doing it justice and for fear of his injunction to me in 1984 never to treat Hindi literature as mere data for language teaching. While in jail in the 1930s, Agye wrote the novel Shekhar Ek Jeevani, a fictional account of the memoirs presented here. His writings were smuggled from jail for publication under his pseudonym, Agye meaning the unknowable, a pen name that saves us many long hours in not having to say or write Satchidan and Hiran and Vatsyayan too often. <laughs> In jail, Agye shared Bismil's disappointment with the character of his fellow prisoners. Hunger strikers secretly snacking and putting on weight with glucose drinks. And he preferred solitary confinement. He found consolation where he could, for example, by catching nightingales by candlelight and filling his cell with their song. But decades later, as his partner Ila Dalmia, elder sister of our Berkeley colleague Vasudha Dalmia, as she tells in her memoirs, Agye would paint window bars white in their Delhi house to exorcise the ghost of those jail memories. With the coming of independence, these freedom fighters were enshrined as national heroes, appropriate subjects for postage stamps. But their powerful autobiographical writing remains largely overlooked as source material for the history of the period. 
At this point, my script says, find a segue to the next topic. <laughs> but perhaps the figure of Mahadevi Verma, Chayavadi poet turned poetic prose writer, will stand on its own. Her work includes a well-known book of character sketches about people connected to her household, household and to the girls' school that she ran in Allahabad. Her character sketch of Alopi, a blind market gardener, who one hot summer day comes hobbling to Mahadevi's house in search of custom, opens like this. Did blind Alopi's life contain even an iota of utility? It would take a metaphysician to answer such a question. To me, his tale seemed a quavering lament sung in a veil of tears. The story of when I first saw him is as pathetic in its strangeness as he was himself. The summer month of Vaishak, like some precocious musician, was doing its utmost to astound the world by playing an endless prelude on his fiery lute. My small house seemed a rustic potter's kiln, while the doors crashing open and closed in the hot wind suggested the pandemonium of a modern factory. I was engaged in a task appropriate to such a clamorous and raging heat. That is to say, I was evaluating, through discerning judgment, the proportions of knowledge and ignorance overflowing from the answer books of my students to establish the value of whatever specks of wisdom they might contain. Mahadevi's character sketches are much admired, though for me her patrician tone weighs too heavily. The lines we've just heard ooze social and literary self-confidence. Despite her rhetorical deference to metaphysics, the author is quite ready to judge what is of utility and what is not, and her high register Hindi would be perfectly unintelligible to its remote subaltern subjects. Mahadevi colludes with her readers, inviting them or us to share the sophisticated pleasures of looking down from on high into humbler worlds. Barely have we met the pathetic figure of Alopi when Mahadevi deserts him to indulge in an evocation of the scorching summer heat. Such learned digressions typify her essayist style. The season is personified, as in classical kavya. Summer is a precocious musician dazzling the world with his fiery vena. The house is a village kiln the banging of wind-blown doors evokes the dark satanic mills of industry, just as the modern world adds needless rigors to existing hardships. But industrial drudgery is remote from the experience of a middle-class intellectual. We do not envisage the fastidious Mahadevi at a factory bench, and her labors this hot summer afternoon are actually limited to the surely agreeable task of grading student essays. Francesca Orsini, writing of Mahadevi as, quote unquote, the reluctant autobiographer, tells us that artistically, Mahadevi was able to create an oblique style that lovingly detailed the daily foibles of individuals around her while steering clear of her own self. While generally, the quote continues, while generally speaking, the autobiographical mode is one that extends outward from a self solidly placed at the center to the, peop uh, to the people that the self comes in contact with, in Mahadevi's case, we have the opposite. She concentrates on people around her while leaving herself at the center obfuscated. The result is a scintillating circle around a hollow center. End of um, Orsini's quote. I reach the opposite view. Whatever Mahadevi's intentions in writing these sketches, the persona they portray most efficiently is her own. The so-called center is far from hollow. It's filled with impressions that think, thicken with every expressed attitude. And far from being reticent, Mahadevi licks her tongue around every well-crafted phrase and clearly enjoys her performance no end. But the downtrodden, so thoroughly patronized by Mahadevi's supercilious pen, find a voice of their own in Dalit writing. A fine example is Kosalya Baisantri's autobiography, Dohra Abhishab, The Double Curse, whose title refers to the paired hindrances of gender and caste. The author reclaims lost social dignity by recounting, with little comment, the details of domestic life in her Dalit community. Her demotic prose is the antithesis of Mahadevi's high style, almost its antidote, one might say. We'll hear this extract in Hindi, restoring for a moment the music that's lost in my dull English renderings. 
Kosalia, re-inhabiting her childhood persona in adulthood, describes how mother would wash the daughter's tangled hair with mud as shampoo, catching and killing the lice, cursing the fate that gave her only female offspring. She weaves together the details of this intimate moment with a broader issue, the commonplace infant mortality that left the family almost without sons. Kosalia commutes easily between tenses and uh, with habitual actions coalesced into a single recalled Sunday. माँ हमेशा बाल धोते वक्त बड़बड़ाती रहती थी देवा मैंने ऐसा कौन सा पाप किया था कि मेरे नसीब में लड़कियां ही लिखी हैं माँ ने लगातार पांच बेटियों को जन्म दिया सबसे बड़ी बहन के बाद एक बेटा हुआ भी परंतु वह डेढ़ वर्ष का होते होते मर गया उसके बाद दो बेटियां हुई वे भी दस ग्यारह महीने की होते होते मर गई उसके बाद माँ को लगातार चार बेटियां हुई अब हम पांच बहने रह गईं। बाद में दो बेटे और एक लड़की का जन्म हुआ उनमें से एक लड़का और एक लड़के की मृत्यु हो गई बहुत सवेरे ही माँ ने लकड़ियां जलाकर चूल्हे पर नहाने के लिए पानी चढ़ाया और एक के बाद एक हम सब के बाल धोने बैठी छोटी बेटी के बाल घने और लंबे थे जो मुश्किल से सुलझ रहे थे माँ खींचते खींचते बाल सुलझा रही थी और साथ में जुओं को भी निकालकर मार रही थी पूरे तीन घंटे लगे थे यह सब करने में काम खत्म करने के बाद माँ ने सबको रात की बची हुई दाल के साथ एक एक रोटी खाने को दी रोटी का नाश्ता सिर्फ रविवार को ही मिलता था क्योंकि उस दिन बहुत सारा काम करने को होता था और खाना देर से बनता था a popular author of a very different stripe is Amrita Pritham, who writes in Hindi as well as her native Punjabi. Her autobiography is a romantic work, moist with lyrical expressionism. Describing her romance with the, the lyricist Sahir Lodhyanvi, she reaches for other memories to express her feelings. Here we find her in Russia, visiting Tolstoy's country estate to the south of Moscow. I remember the first time I went to Yasinaya Poliana and heard a song of silence that cannot be put into words. I entered the room that held Tolstoy's 22,000 books. It had once been his bedroom. The white shirt he wore in his last days hung there on the wall. A breeze wafted through an open window, ruffling the shirt. A sleeve brushed lightly against me. I trembled. It was as though Tolstoy himself had reached out and touched my shoulder. Later, I sat for a long time at his graveside in the woods, with leaves falling from the trees all around me. I picked up a leaf and took it home with me when I left. I have it still, keeping faith. Her style is impressionistic and aerial. The ghostly touch of Tolstoy's shirt evokes the touch of her beloved Sahir, while also claiming, through devout reverence, a connection to the great Russian novelist himself. Writing some decades after Sahir's death, her images drip with bittersweet nostalgia. Tolstoy's estate is a museum, if not a mausoleum. His forest grave is a place of pilgrimage. Its fallen leaves, mementos of a writer she never knew, and a man she loved but was denied. The narrative element is small, almost irrelevant, just a hook to hang her feelings on. She doesn't really narrate, she suggests implies, alludes, and intimates. Penultimately, I come to probably the least known book in this treasure box, and one of the most remarkable. It's the candid memoir of a station master, Dolat Ram, born in 1907. It's a subaltern confessional, whose author leaves little unsaid in describing his various postings and adventures in stations around the Udaipur and Chitorga region of Rajasthan. We learn of his hypochondriac mother, a true drama queen, of Dalit Ram's gradual promotion up the railway hierarchy, of graft and nepotism, of religiosity, both real and fake, of philanthropic works such as well building, of being rather too willingly seduced by a young widow one hot summer night 
in the parcel record room on the platform. Of a sadhu demanding milk fresh from the cow at the end of a long, journey, a long train journey. And of many other things, sad, joyful, comical, strange, noble, and scurrilous. Drafting this paragraph, I wrote that I know of no other book like it in Hindi. But then I realized that I do, of course I do, and I'll come to that comparison in a moment. Meanwhile, here is Dalat Ram, Urf Jishnu Shankar, looking back over his life from old age. I still have all my teeth, the full set of 32, and they are all real, all mine. Until last year, I would take a walk of four or five miles a day, and even now I am dependent on nobody for my basic needs. I took to the bhang habit in my youth and have enjoyed it every evening without fail, right up until the last three months or so. I have given up cigarettes and beauties for now, but make no promises as to the future. When the chance comes along, I will happily share a little charas or ganja with some sadhu or baba. No abstentions in my diet either. As for dressing well, I am as keen as ever. Wearing baggy old clothes or being casual about cleanliness, like other retired people, is not for me. To be easygoing and free from care is the recipe for life and is probably the secret of my good health too. My children are happy to see me flourishing. My eldest son has been living overseas for several years and every visit home he brings me something nice an embroidered shirt from the Philippines, an Indonesian batik, or a suede jacket and fur hat from China, suits and overcoats made in France, Germany and England, shoes from Italy, all sorts of things. I dress up and go about town in fine style. <laughs> Dalat Ram's Dalat Darbar record records the vicissitudes of life in a most compelling way. The text it most resembles is the last I'll refer to, but it's perhaps the first ever Indian work that might be called an autobiography. The Jain merchant and theologian Banarsi Das wrote his tale in AD 1641. He was 55, and thinking himself halfway through an idealized lifespan of 110 years, rashly called his text Ard Kathanak, or half a story, or a half story. But then he died two years later, skewing the arithmetic badly, just as Krishna Chandra was to do three and a half centuries later. He calls the work Nidzkatha, his own story, but doesn't align it with any genre. Let me warn you that two people I introduced to Ard Kathanak within the last few years went away to write books about it, so be careful. At the end of his frank, frank and feisty tale, Banarasi balances the record of his life in an astonishing account sheet of virtues and vices. He writes here in the third person. His verse is metrical and rhymed and is composed in the Braj dialect with touches of Kariboli. In common tongues he frames the scripture's airs. No other poet bears the fame he bears. Forgiving, well-contented, good at heart, he's well-versed in the versifier's art. Works classical he'll cite aright and true, and country rhymes recite like me or you. He knows the sense of words and plots their course. He sees the world, but seeing shuns remorse. He's sweet of voice, affectionate to all, a Jane by faith the faith to faith in thrall. He tolerates all things and speaks no ill, Secure of mind and resolute of will. A font of good advice with counsel free, his heart's as clear of taint as hearts can be. To lie with others' wives is not his style, and other vices too he shuns as vile. His heart is pure, well balanced is his mind, and many are his virtues of such kind. No one of them is small nor yet so great, nor any truly fine to celebrate. Now, just as all his virtues here I've told, let me report his vices manifold. Of ire and pride and guile his load is light, but greed for lucre is a grievous blight. He's laughter's fool, his karma so ensures. He loves to stay at home behind closed doors. 
No right or holy practice fits his mould, while charity and worship leave him cold. The slightest profit raises him to bliss, a tiny loss and he's in woe's abyss. Quite shamelessly he'll say what's best unsaid, or let the art of clowning fill his head. The tales he tells are those one should not chance. Oft when alone he'll break into a dance. He makes up things he's never seen or heard, and speaks of them in public, false in word. Enthralled is he with any comic scene, while lies and falsehoods are his daily mean. A sudden sense of dread oft grips his heart, and once it's there it will not quickly part. Both qualities and faults within him see, whichever fate prescribes, that comes to be. Here then's Benarsi's story simply told, in broad strokes, as it's known throughout the world. The poet who reckons it a fault to dance in solitude burrows into our affections like no other. He died in 1643, so he's one autobiographer that I didn't meet. Though sometimes when I read him, I can't be quite sure about this. Each of the two lists, the virtues and the vices, includes precisely 16 items. That is, it's a double sola shringar, a conventional poetic listing of the qualities or attributes normally of a textual heroine. To adopt such rhetorical patterns was doubtly instinctive for a poet of Benarsi's time. The long focus of hindsight makes such things easy to spot, while the instincts of a modern autobiographer are perhaps too close to the lens to be seen with such clarity. Benarsi's balanced account of virtue and vice is the work of both a merchant, whose instincts make him balance the books, and a poet, whose training supplies a conceit with which to do it. How many modern autobiographers are so searingly honest? Most stress their virtues, even if a subtext trail may lead us to the other side of the balance sheet. What then to do with it all? This is just a beginning and I have a lot of thinking to do. The Routledge New Critical Idiom textbook series has a work on autobiography by Linda Anderson. It's wittily entitled Autobiography. <laughs> it isn't one. And in her opening paragraph, she says, the very pervasiveness and slipperiness of autobiography has made the need to contain and control it within disciplinary boundaries all the more urgent and many literary critics have turned to definitions as a way of stamping their academic authority on an unruly and even disreputable field. I intend no stamping, control or containment. Rather, I wish to understand and appreciate the perceptions of these many authors and to enjoy the varied ways in which they have reanimated their past and hence our own. As for urgency, all in good time. As a reader, I like to examine the alchemy of their language that makes these memories come alive. As a teacher, I like to share this with others as best I can. So the texts I've spoken about, and many, many others, all feature in a reader that I'm preparing. This is its working title, and alluding not only to the act of memory, but also to portraits of Hind, a kind of Bharat Darshan, or vision of India assembled from these disparate but complementary perspectives. Thank you. Can I go now? <laughs> Kirsten. I had a question. Um, the, the passage that you had just new read, mm -hmm. um, it really struck me how different it was for me that passage, knowing just new, and then hearing his voice, and um, you know, not. <laughs> um, and I found it very interesting because now, of course, I that 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 if I was reading that right, and I'd heard I, just his voice would be inseparable from the prose that I was reading. And you had mentioned that you met a lot of these people, and I was thinking what a different experience it would be for you when you could hear their voice when you're reading this. Mm -hmm. Thinking about readers 
at the time or the audit, you know, who was the audience for these things and how maybe did these um, autobiographers embody themselves in the text? Because you have a lot of pictures. Did they, did they, tr do you think there was a way that they were trying to get their voice attached to an image of their person and are there physical ways that this is done in terms of you know, representing themselves with photographs or the line drawing of the guy against the horse? Um, is there is there ways that there's this kind of attachment or embodiment of some kind of self there that goes tries to go beyond kind of a, a textual prose to something oral or visual or? I mean, certainly there are most of these books are illustrated in some way or other with photographs, typically rather grainy, grey photographs from the 30s and so forth. Um, I don't know to what extent they're really. I think there are, there are probably as many answers to that question as there are books, actually, because there is, this isn't really a standard genre. It's all sorts of different kinds of writing about self. Many, some of them are real autobiographies, where clearly there's a sense to uh, an attempt to engage with one's sort of inner self and question motivations and do all those things that you kind of expect in an autobiography. Others are much more, how should I say, kind of external, memoirs of things that have happened that they observe like a camera. But even in those, as I said in the talk, there's lots of feedback that you get from the way in which they, they express those things, and that's what's um, very interesting to me. The, the idea of the voice and Jishnuji and all my other heroes and heroines around the room um, was that um, I find that all these texts, they're all very, very different stylistically, but because they come through the filter or lens of a single translator, i.e. me, they end up sounding a little bit samey, so I thought a way of countering that was to have them read out by different voices. So that, I mean, it may not be that, that, um, that Jishnuji and Dalit Ram are kind of separated at birth. But they, oh, he says they were, actually, yes. yes. I think it's the, the bang part of it that appealed to him. Um, but, but that at least there was some kind of sense of, of a variety there. And then also I realized the great benefit of actually having, to, having time off during the talk, you know, which is a, another benefit. Akbar. That was a great talk. Thanks, Rupert. I wanted to get back to the last quote that you projected and sort of get into this issue of truth claims of autobiography. And, well, one simple question I had was, did, do you consider any modern verse work as autobiographical? Uh, at the top, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of an example, but that doesn't mean much. Yeah, because what I'm wondering is, in order for something to be classified as autobiography, you talk about Amrita Pritam. What about Sahir's Parchaya? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in which there's a very strong I. Mm -hmm. and you're talking about disarmament, destruction, love, or loss, all of that. So why can we not read Parchaya mm -hmm. as a work of autobiography? Mm. Yeah, and so I'm just wondering if the seriousness is enhanced of the self-narrative when it appears in the prose form and when it appears as verse, uh, there's this idea that there are all sorts of poetic liberties and narrative liberties that are compromised by the rigid requirements of the verse. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are all sorts of there's all sorts of interplay between these different genres. And actually, one of the thoughts that kept coming to me as I was working on this, and I only started this in November, so it's all very new material to me, um, very unprocessed, is that, you know, why, why even bother with, with trying to ca call it anything? I mean, the beauty of these texts is, is, is in its own writing. It's each one is an individual piece. And um, the kind of academic task of trying to categorize and so forth seems far less interesting to me. I mean, it's not really what I'm interested in so much as a trying to understand how the alchemy of language works, that the individual poets or, I mean, uh, writers rather, are using language to express themselves in different ways. But I think there's every degree of, whether it's prose or poetry, every degree of, um, of, of ways of playing with the idea of self and of historical historicity. I mean, there are many, many parts of these autobiographies where one's pretty sure that, you know, this is not a historical record. And some of them even challenge each other, quite interestingly, to um, um, especially Bachchan, poor fellow, whose, whose autobiography is referred to all over the place because of the great success of his one published in the 60s. Um, a lot of people disagree with his memories. So, I mean, I think, 
I don't think, I'm not re myself uh, really happy with the status of the genre. I certainly agree with you that one can find depictions of self in everything. I mean, surely every poet who writes is writing about his or her, her own self. And um, it, you supply the thinnest narrative thread and you've got what is effectively auto autobiography, I guess. Yes. It's curious, like uh, people like Dalat Ram, mm -hmm. are they kind of paying to get their own books published, or who publishes these? That was actually published by a national publishing house. I don't know. I, it's a very interesting question. He was. Um, it was suggested to him that he write his memoirs by his son, um, who initially started transcribing them from an oral dictation, but then Dalat Ram sort of took over the process. It's a little bit obscure. I don't know anything about it other than the book itself, because I've not been able to find out yet anything else about either the father or the son, although the son is actually an established academic somewhere in um, East Asia, I think, now as a sociologist, sociology professor. Um, so I don't, I get the impression that he wrote it rather for himself and that publication wasn't really particularly what he was aiming for, but that then it, it became published. I don't, but I, yes, there's a lot, lot more digging I have to do to find out about that, that sort of thing. And like, do each of these writers uh, indulge in some kind of a justification as to why ex exactly they're writing these texts? Uh, is it for, you know, Atmananda or you know, their own self-pleasure or is it, you know, what's the, you know, do they talk about it in, in a variety of these texts? Again, it varies an awful lot from text to text. I mean, yes, a lot of them include some kind of preface or introduction which, do, which, which describe how it is that they came to think of doing this. Often that's suggested to them by a friend. Often, uh, well, I didn't say often, but certainly um, more than one, where people are seeing the established reputations of other writers and reading their biographies or autobiographies and thinking, hmm, I should go down that route too. That's the way to glory and fortune. Um, other people seem to be um, wanting to contextualize their own writing. I mean, this is one of the problems I had in translating Butchan, that in a sense there are whole passages of that book which are like a commentary on his poetry. They describe the, the, the context in which he wrote it, the feelings that he was having at the time, his difficulty and then ease of getting things published, all that sort of contextual information is there in the narrative. He even describes uh, one terrible event where he went to a college to recite Madhushala and on the way back um, one of the boys in the college who had been very moved by the poetry actually threw himself under the wheels of Bachchan's train and killed himself. So there are a lot of contextualizing kind of details like that which you know, help make us see the, the literature in, in different ways. I suspect most of my answers will be of this kind. Well, they're all different, you know. I haven't yet really very clearly perceived um, all the sort of linkages here, and um, I, I enjoy the variety. I don't mm, particularly expect to find a lot of satisfaction in saying this is a autobiographical trope, 37B, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you just clarify, you had a handful of the writers that you characterize their, their prose as writerly. Yeah. What, what is writerly as opposed to what? You know, it's almost like they're, 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 setting out, um, they're setting out prose fiction. It's what it feels like. There's a lot of reconstructed dialogue, and the dialogue is, is, wit is wittier than it probably was in the original. It's quite crafted. Um, there are a lot of literary tropes used of various different kinds. The actual um, flow of the language is very controlled. Um, and there's a, running through the whole thing, there's an, um, a will or an aspiration to make it interesting, to make it pleasant to read. And uh, what, uh, what I would regard as the opposite of that are these rather plonking kind of endless uh, accounts by politicians and people like that who just tell you, I mean, they even you know, list committee memberships and things like that. And even when they're not doing actual lists, they're telling you things about, um, um, they're narrating events, events in a very plodding kind of way. So maybe I, all I mean by it is a kind of just a skillful writing. Is, is it good writing or is it bad writing? Patrick. Rupert, um, the whole genre of autobiography, I'd like to be calling, writing about yourself. 
is something that is not there in the Indian tradition until early pre-modern times. Is the 16, what, 41? 41. Whatever you talked about, is that one of the earliest or the earliest that you can find? People say it's the earliest. I mean, there are, of course, there are other things like um, diaries and so forth, the Mughal diaries and things like that, which are considerably earlier. Um, but I think as the, the it is it is felt, I, I don't know that there may be other claims in other languages who can tell that range of literature, but it seems to be the earliest or one of the earliest attempts to really do the autobiographical thing. And he sets out the at the beginning to say, um, I am going to tell the story of my life and I'm going to tell it in such a language as this, it's Madhya um, Desaki Boli Bol, speaking the, 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 the dialect of Middle India. Um, either he's going to, he, so he, he's quite sort of structured in his recounting of information of what he's doing. He knows that he's going to tell his life. And then once he's told you that, that's sort of almost like the introductory section, then he drops into third person. And he, most of the narrative then is third person. And then occasionally he kind of steps outside the inverted commas and becomes himself again. It's a very interesting combination. Historical influencers may have uh, prompted him to write this? No, but he's, he's written, I mean, his other works are all theological things. They're all, all um, studies of Jain um, theology. Um, um, well, Jainism of various kinds. Um, one of the things which comes through the text most frequently and most tellingly is his linking of events to karma. He says, you know, if something good happens to him, something bad happens to him, he's very quick to say, this is the result of, you know, something earlier. And it, sometimes it seems to me that the purpose of the book is to do that, is to use his own life as a kind of example to show how karma works or, or how that kind of principle of um, action and reaction happens in the world. But I don't know, it's very hard, it's like it suddenly appears as this kind of ready-made autobiography where, the, where there is no kind of, um, there's no kind of precedent for it. He talks, uh, there are references to other poems that he recites to friends or he recites for money. So he's clearly kind of occupying a literary world to some extent. But basically... Did he read any European language? Sorry? Did he read any European language? There's not, nothing, nothing, no reference outside India at all, right, right through it. But, I mean, what's interesting about him is he's really a, he's really a merchant. He's, he's primarily a jewel merchant, and he's a really bad one. Because, <laughs> I mean, he's always losing, losing things, and he ties jewels in his waistband and they fall out. And, <laughs> And he's also very frequently, this is one of the things that reminds me, that, that, that sort of connects with Dalit Ram, is that he's constantly being duped by fake sannyasis of one kind and another, you know? There's a, he, he, uh, he buys a mantra from a sannyasi, which he's supposed to recite in the bathroom every morning. And after he's done it for a full year, he's supposed to find a gold coin on the doorstep. And surprise, surprise, he doesn't. And he's very fed up with this, and uh, all sorts of things happen. But it's, it's a wonder, completely wonderful text, and it inter interlocks with history so much. I mean, there's a description of his reaction to the news of the death of Akbar, the Emperor Akbar. He actually describes in detail what he felt and what happened to him. He was sitting in his house in Jaunpur on the steps of his courtyard, and somebody told him that Akbar had died. And he fainted and he fell down the steps and, and hit his forehead against the stone of the, of the courtyard. And his mother had to put him to bed and apply burnt cloth to the wound to sterilize it. And then he describes all the unrest in the city because with, without somebody in charge, without a kingpin, uh, society is threatened and so forth. And all the merchants are bustling around, hiding their goods, burying their wealth and um, all the rich people go around in poor people's clothes and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of kind of social history tied up in it. We read this text in translation last semester in Dr. Talbot's Yeah. Text. And um, <clears throat> speaking of, of Banarsidas' reception of the views of Akbar's death, throughout the text, he, I mean, his, his wife repeatedly dies, wives repeatedly dies. His children, he, he's left childless after, after fathering like eight or nine yeah. kids. Yeah, nine, yeah. Nine kids. And, um, and this is just kind of like casually mm -hmm. 
another wife died. And another, another kid died. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then you have this uh, just to very dramatic reaction to the death of um, the, king, uh, the emperor. And um, I, Dr. Talbot asked the question in class, you know, why, why this autobiography? And the only thing that I can think of is that um, you know she's sitting three down the road, don't you? <laughs> Be careful what you say. The only thing that I can think of is that, is that you know, he, he, had no, he had no kids. He had no, he had, nobody was going to carry on his story. And so I thought of that as like, what is your impression? You spoke briefly about you know, why he wrote this. But like, do you think, he, do you think that's part of it at all? Is that, do you take that away from Yes, I think there's a little bit of that, but I don't think it's hugely important. I think if it had been hugely important, he'd have told us so, because um, he's, he's not slow to say what he's thinking. And um, you know, there isn't really any particular uh, ambition in it to say, you know, this is for posterity so that my name doesn't die out or something. But I mean, who knows? It could have been a motivation. But you're right about the, the different kinds of reaction to death. I mean, um, but it kind of makes sense. I mean, he, as, a, as a merchant, he was really concerned about uh, sort of, as it were, security, right? And he was terrified of insurrection of various kinds. And it happened to him. I mean, there are long accounts of having to go into hiding and have to, have, uh, uh, of having to hide from this or that faction. So it was pretty real. It wasn't just like, you know, reading on the news that there's going to be a change of government. I mean, it was a very closely experienced feeling Compared with which, I suppose, you know, infant mortality was very much more of a daily reality then than it would be now. What are you going to make of it? But then there are, I mean, he makes up for the fact that he doesn't write a lot of detail about that by some stunning single liners in the original text where he really shows his pain about all these death, these family deaths. And it's just, I mean, there's just one line where he does it particularly, and he uses such superb sort of poetics in the description of that. But it seems to make up, it speaks a lot just in one line. Your translation was better than one. Well, I felt that, I mean, in a sense, did you read the Mukundlat one, the, the prose one? Yeah? The new one. The new one, Rohani Chaudhary one, right. I mean, I think it, in a sense, to give some kind of a sense of it, you, you need a, 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 at least a metrical translation, if not, a, not actually a rhyming one. Of course. I deliberately didn't show you the original, so you weren't making comparisons. So, I mean, it's, you know, take a little license. Rowan. Um, I was wondering, you spoke about the Hussein biography where he um, talks about his own childhood in the third person. This biography is why he talks about most of his life in the third person. And then in contrast to that, there are recounts of the past that are taking place in the present. Then I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of push and pull between what is literary convention the relationship that somebody has to their own past and personal life. Like, how do you read the, the syntax of that? Uh, explain a little bit more what you mean by the syntax does of the that. Fact, does the fact that um, Hussein is referring to his own childhood as the boy, does that show us just sort of a literary convention, or is that a break between how this boy became the man and the artist? And when this woman is recounting in the present tense what happened to her in her childhood, right. does that indicate a sort of closeness that isn't present in other texts, or is it just convention? Well, in the, the, the Dalit one you're referring to, the one that we heard in Hindi, right? I mean, that's, um, that is written, in a sense, in the first person. But I mean, there's very, there's, there isn't really a constant presence of the first person voice in it. You know, there's, it's very much descriptive of other things happening. And you kind of put together the sense of her own place in the middle of all that. Um, Hussein, I think, I mean, that it's a very his autobiography is very strange. It's it's um, it's very episodic. It doesn't really attempt a, a con continuous thread of narrative. It's more it's very impressionistic. It's what you might expect in a sense from from someone who's used to doing paintings. It's almost like a series of, of word paintings. And I think in that sense. Um, you know, just as it's perhaps difficult to give a sense of, of I in painting a picture, it, it's very much the same kind of thing that he's doing in, in painting those word pictures of the events of his life. But it's a strange text, and um, it's handwritten. 
I mean, the, the published version is in handwriting, not his own. Um, but um, it, it comes across very much as an artifact. I mean, it, it, almost every page is illustrated. And you feel that the words and the pictures are almost sort of interchangeable and go with each other as this kind of uh, depiction of his life. And in that sense, I think it was a good decision on his part to go for a third person narrator, because the sort of eyeiness of that just doesn't kind of figure in that kind of writing, I think. But that's, I don't have a sophisticated answer to your question. It would, these are things that need a lot of thought. And I've just been, every time I've thought to myself since November, I must sort of stop reading these things and start thinking about them. And then I find another one. I think, oh, <laughs> let me just read this one. And, you know, and so it is. It's just such exciting stuff. And especially all, the, all these linkages between these people, and they're roughly this, sort of contemporary with each other, give or take a few decades, and they keep, they keep meeting each other and marrying each other and uh, fighting each other. And it's just such an amazing world. And the reason, part of the reason that I'm doing, making a reader out of it is that you will judge if this is right or not because we've used one of these in our class, but the, these kind of excerpts, uh, it's easier to pull it out of an autobiography than it is out of, out of work of fiction, where you really de do need to know much more about the overall plan. And especially these sort of childhood chapters, I think they're just wonderful as, as in almost little self-contained narratives in their own right. Joe. Yeah. I was just curious, when you were reading that last volume on autobiography as a genre, when you were reading it, did you have the sense that, oh, these, these fit in within this, this sort of world uh, genre of autobiography? Or did you get a sense that there was something very distinctive about Indian or Hindi autobiography, that it, that it wasn't fitting in with the kind of things she was talking about? No, I think it does fit in. I mean, I think that she talks a lot about distinctions of genre between um, memoirs and autobiography, for example. And I think you could apply those sorts of um, categories to, to this material. Um, and I'm, I, I feel that also that some of the kind of theoretical positions that people take on autobiography, for those kinds of people, a lot of this writing probably wouldn't count at all, because these aren't, these are not, this is not a series of books called you know, autobiography. I mean, some, about half of them are. But some of them, they're just from the prefaces to, um, to other books to books of maybe short stories or something like that, or their um, short little narratives taken from here and there, all sorts of different things. And um, sometimes you know, they're, they're supposedly, as I said, they're supposedly writing about somebody else. A lot of people write, there's this, it is kind of a genre in its own right, I guess, this kind of sansmaran thing where people write, you know, they, they write a little anthology of 10 or 15 pieces about the great and the good that they've encountered in their lives. So you, you get the same characters coming up over and again. You get Nehru, you get various historical characters, you get Gandhi, you get Vinoba, you know, you get lots of different kind of encounters with these people. But they, they're very, very um, interesting from the point of view of what they're actually saying about the author. They're not usually terribly interesting about the alleged subject. One more question. Last um, do you have any uh, um, comparison with the autobiographies written in English by Indians, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Hindi ones? There, what sort of connections are there? Um, I, I, it, these are like sort of homework questions you're giving me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> these are things I need to go away and think about. Um, The, the, you know, there are a lot of these He's texts which... Top, you know I know. <laughs> that's, that's what's worrying me. Um, the, I, there are a lot of these things which I feel that there, there's a degree of intimacy in these Hindi accounts that I, I can't quite imagine coming out in English. And in fact, I found them... Um, I mean, I talked about translation problems. I did find some of these really hard to translate in the sense that... Um, I often felt that I wasn't doing them justice. I wasn't capturing their tone or their register correctly. I mean, I did that kind of false start with the um, Hussein one, just to, to show that, you know, how quickly one can fall into the wrong kind of voice and you feel that you're actually inventing a completely different kind of book. 
But I think there are a lot of the, of the sort of more intimate portraits are things that I can't think of quite existing in the English literature. And unfortunately, those ones from Hindi which have been translated into English are mostly done very badly, without really much sense of voice or individuality about them at all. It would be very hard to see that you know, there's a kind of consistent voice in this book which is different from that one. So the answer is, learn Hindi and read them in Hindi. <laughs> the answer really is, buy my book when it comes out. <laughs> I thought you had your free one. No, no, no. <laughs> You're not on the selection committee. I think we've kept past the required time. Thank you.